What's going on ladies and gentlemen, my name is Michael and welcome to Fudge Muppet. Today we're pumped to bring you our very first build for the brand spanking new Fallout 4 DLC, Nuka World. This build is called the Raider Overboss. Forget everything you know about grey villains with questionable moralities. The Overboss is pure evil, no two ways about it. This guy makes Satan himself seem like not such a bad dude. The Overboss is devious and manipulative. He will abuse people's fears to control them, forcing them to stay in line or face his fury. This vicious leader employs a large force of raiders to carry out his every need and desire, and with this power he aims to own the commonwealth. You cannot deny the Overboss's ambition. He wakes up every morning determined to be even more wicked than the day before. This build uses intimidation and charisma to boss NPCs around while he sprays a lethal barrage of bullets from his automatic rifle. Now before we get started, just remember that there are timestamps in the description below with links to each segment of the video. But without further ado, let's get into the backstory. The Overboss was born into the average Boston suburban lifestyle. His family, though, were poorer than most. His father worked two jobs while his mother worked long hours at the local Super Duper Mart. Due to their financial woes, they barely had enough time to give their only child a pampered life. From a very young age, the Overboss learned to cook and clean in his parents' absence, and was comfortable keeping to himself in his home and school life. After all, he couldn't really make friends when all the other school children were bragging about the latest toys and gadgets their parents had bought them, courtesy of their cushy jobs. The other boss considered most people quite predictable, in fact. Give them the material possession they longingly crave for, and they'll toss their individuality aside just to fit in with everybody else. The Overboss didn't have things as easy as his peers, and in some respects he felt unique as a result of it. Typically, as you'd expect, the bigger kids didn't like the Overboss. He was different, therefore he was a freak. The Overboss was small and a late-blooming teenager, which didn't help his situation in high school. He was frequently bullied by the larger kids, but he was no stranger to hardship, and he took it in his stride, taking silent satisfaction in the fact that these primitive degenerates would amount to nothing in the real world. The Overboss endured tasteless physical harassment for a number of years, until one dreary Boston afternoon he'd had just about enough. One particularly hollow-headed bully, who coined himself Ace for his apparent sporting prowess, decided to show off in front of his friends. The Overboss sat on a ledge in the alleyway behind the Super Duper Mart, sipping a new Coca-Cola, and Ace struck the drink from his hands, sending it to shatter on the pavement. The Overboss felt a vicious rage rise up from a part of him he didn't even know existed. He scooped up the broken bottle, blood trickling from his fingers where the jagged shards caught him, and charged at Ace. The bully stumbled, falling clumsily onto his back, and the Overboss held the bottle to his throat. He wondered why he'd also been grinning. His jaw ached from the intensity of it, but there was something exhilarating about taking control. From that moment on, the Overboss was never fucked with again. The bigger kids seemed to revere him all of a sudden, treading lightly in his presence. He soon found he could manipulate their fear for his own gain, and he embraced it. Once school finished up, many of the ex-bullies turned to drugs. The Overboss found that this made them much easier to influence and continued to associate with them. They may have been a bunch of lowlives, but he enjoyed being part of a collective, especially one with simple motivations that he could bend to his will. Soon it became apparent to the Overboss though that the military was the only realistic option for work that he was sufficiently qualified for. He joined the US Armed Forces in hopes of making enough money for a comfortable life, and served a full term fighting the Chinese in Alaska. He was hesitant to admit it, but he relished the feeling of true power he got when taking the life of an enemy. As he grew, he also started to develop physically. He had unexpected growth spurts, making him look much more fierce. Upon returning home, the Overboss nestled back into familiar habits. The high school has-beens were still little more than drug addicts, and they welcomed the homecoming of their new leader. A few months later though, the Overboss was arrested in possession of large quantities of illicit drugs, and was held accountable in court. He was represented by a Boston public defendant named Nora, and he found himself falling for her. In pursuing her, the Overboss vowed to leave his past behind, and they settled down for a quiet life in the tranquil suburb of Sanctuary Hills. For a time, the Overboss was genuinely happy. That was until that fateful day when the bombs dropped and everything came crashing down. 
When the overboss emerges from Vault 111, he is livid with himself for ever changing his ways and believing that a good, honest life was achievable. He realizes that, while it may look drastically different, the rules of the new Boston were still the same. He had a choice. He could live in caution, frail and afraid of his surroundings, or he could take control, putting a broken glass to the throat of the Commonwealth. He remembers how it felt to be in charge, inspiring loyalty in the savage beasts of his high school through intimidation and elects to take the same approach now. He turns his back on the joys of raising a family and decides he will bend everyone to his will, declaring ownership of the wasteland and all who inhabit it. The overbossed will waste no time doing favors and helping others. He will purely be looking out for himself. In true rate of fashion, he takes what he wants and doesn't spare a thought for those inconvenienced by his actions. He views everyone in post-war Boston like he did the bullies at his old high school, simple-minded and ready to take orders. One thing all people share is a sense of fear, and he will utilize this as a tool to dominate them. In terms of main game factions, the Overboss disdains them all. He believes the Brotherhood of Steel have no right to lay claim to the Commonwealth and perceives them as cowardly, hiding behind power armor. Any faction with plans to annex land are a nuisance to the Overboss, so like the Brotherhood, he will also demolish the Railroad and the Minutemen. He also considers the motivations of the Railroad to be naive and ignorantly optimistic, so he has no issue extinguishing them and instead takes great pleasure from it. While he has no intentions of letting the Institute seize any of his land on the surface, he can tolerate their goals enough to use their support and firepower. He sees the Institute's choice to dwell underground as a subconscious display of respect to him, as he is the only one capable of ruling such unruly terrain. After catching wind of the abandoned Nuka-Cola amusement park, the Overboss is excited by the potential it has to be his base of operations. He'll make it his primary goal to seek out the park and rise to the top of the internal radar hierarchy, or at least to remain at the top once he gets there. Plus, it's been a great many years since the Overboss has properly been able to enjoy an ice-cold Nuka-Cola without interruption. Up next are the stats. At the beginning of the game, the Overboss's special stats will be 1 Strength, 1 Perception, 8 Endurance, 10 Charisma, 4 Intelligence, 2 Agility, and 2 Luck. The extra point, courtesy of the special book, will go into luck so that the Overboss can invest in the glorious Bloody Mess perk quite soon. So you may be wondering why this dominant ruler has such inadequate strength. Well, the Overboss was always considerably smaller than his peers. He was able to reach heights that weren't possible physically through his ability to persevere and intimidate. For most of his life, he was a pretty good endorsement for the notion that size does not matter. That said, later on he grew a lot, but he still didn't get ridiculously strong. He also finds himself feeling weakened by the cryotechnology of Vault 111. As a result, he will not be relying on high strength to make his mark on the world. On a similar note, perception is also not his forte. One of the Overboss's greatest assets is his ability to survive. He endured as a somewhat neglected child, fending for himself at an age when most children couldn't function a toaster. He was resilient despite his size when the denser boys outgrew him and began pushing him around. And through all of this, the Overboss gave the Brutes their orders like brainwashed minions. He's an expert of endurance, enough to warrant an investment of 8 points, and will rely on this to face the many dangers of the Commonwealth. There is little the post-apocalyptic world can dish out that the Overboss can't take in his stride. His other significant strength is his charisma. Evidently, he isn't a smooth-talking charmer. He exchanges the lure for the ability to scare and subdue those around him until they are too afraid to defy him. His daunting presence will prove to be his ticket to power. Ten points of charisma are well and truly earned for the Raider Overboss. His memories of high school weren't really associated with academic achievement, nevertheless he was not an idiot. He understands what makes people tick and he acquired a number of useful skills while in the military. His charisma most certainly compensates where his intelligence falls short, but 4 points will make sure the overboss can look after himself and his weapons when the going gets tough. Lastly, the overboss's agility and luck sit at 2 points apiece. Combat effectiveness and cat-like reflexes aren't talents the Overboss can boast, and his life has hardly been a showcase of good fortune. He paves his own path in the wasteland and relies on his abundance of menacing goons to do the majority of his bidding. Now let's get into the Overboss's essential perks. For the Endurance stat tree, you'll want to invest in the first rank of Aquaboy and all ranks of Rad Resistant. 
As we know, the Overboss can tolerate the hazards of the wasteland, and radiation won't be something he lets stand in his way. Aqua Boy means he won't take rad damage from swimming, and he'll also be able to breathe underwater. Level 4 of Rad Resistance will grant an impressive plus 40 radiation resistance. Next is Adamantium Skeleton. Years pitted against relentless aggressive bullies appears to have given the Overboss quite a substantial pain threshold. Maxing out this perk will completely eliminate limb damage as a factor in survival scenarios. The Overboss is a no-nonsense kind of guy. If something helps him thrive in a sticky situation, morals and inhibitions cease to exist. If feasting on the flesh of a fallen friend or foe offers him health benefits, the Overboss will chow down before confronting any onlooker who may disapprove. The Cannibal Perk offers a delicious new choice of cuisine, and at max rank, eating human ghoul or soup mutant corpses will restore a total of 50 health each. Next up is one of the most useful perks of this build, one which the Overboss's exceptional endurance skill makes possible. He is such a proficient survivalist that he is solar powered. Maxing this perk grants the Overboss plus two strength and endurance between the hours of 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. Sunlight will heal roughly four rads and 0.5% of total health per second. In order to open the door to this perk though, it's important to note that you will need the bobblehead and you will need to allocate a perk point into the endurance stat, increasing it by a total of two points. From the charisma stat line, you'll want cap collector. This will give you better prices and let you invest in stores to raise their buying capacity. This will come in handy when you and your gang of raiders take over settlements across the map. As a master manipulator, the Animal Friend, Wasteland Whisperer, and Intimidation perks are a must-have. We recommend the first rank of the first two, permitting you the opportunity to pacify animals and creatures, and all ranks of intimidation. After all, the Overboss specializes in exploiting the motivations of humans. At max rank, this perk gives the chance to pacify hostile human enemies, and subsequently incite them to attack or give them specific commands. Lastly, from Charisma, we have the Inspirational perk, and we're getting two ranks of this, meaning that your companions can't hurt you or be harmed by you, and they'll also gain a plus 20% damage boost and plus 20 energy and ballistic resistance. The Overboss's time in the military wasn't such a waste in hindsight. Years of service lead to an efficiency in the use of medicine and the maintenance of weaponry. This is reflected through three ranks of medic and all the ranks of gun nut. With three ranks of medic, stim packs will restore 80% of lost health, rat away will remove 80% of all rads, and gun nut will allow you to bolster your handmade rifle with the necessary mods to punch holes more effectively in your opposition. The Overboss will be using a deadly fully automatic rifle, which we'll talk about in the gear section. Taking all ranks of the commando perk from the agility stat line will give this rifle double damage and a 6% chance to stagger enemies. Finally, we have luck. The Overboss is a survivalist, and he knows where to look to find valuable resources, and as a raider, that's pretty much the job description. Take what you want and ask questions, never. Maxing the Fortune Finder and Scrounger perks increases the amount of caps and ammo found in containers. For some unknown reason, this also means there is a chance firing the last round of a clip will replenish some ammo, and there's even the possibility that killing an enemy will result in an explosive shower of caps. Last but not least comes the essential perk of every psychotic bloodthirsty raider, and that is Bloody Mess. This will give us plus 15% more damage, and sometimes enemies will explode into a visceral red paste, potentially transferring the same fate to other enemies in the vicinity. The raiders may be despicable beings, but they know how to have a good time. Not including gear, but including all bobbleheads, the Overboss's special stats will be 2 Strength, 2 Perception, 10 Endurance, 11 Charisma, 5 Intelligence, 3 Agility, and 4 Luck. As for gear, before you make it to Nuka World, you'll want to track down any assortment of Raider Leathers and Armor Pieces. Whatever looks the most rusted, filthy, and likely to be ridden with disease is a safe bet for the Overboss. Along with this, track down the best automatic rifle you can get your hands on. After conquering Nuka World, the Overboss's endgame apparel will consist of the torn shirt and jeans under the Disciple's spiked helmet, left arm, right arm, left leg, right leg, and packed chest armor. This armor set can be obtained in the Nuka World DLC and has a dangerous, rigid aesthetic perfectly resembling the personality of this monster. The torn shirt and jeans provides a valuable plus two endurance, while the complete armor has 136 damage resistance and 145 energy resistance. The chest piece even comes with an impaled blue teddy bear on the front, 
effective in its ability to further creep the fuck out of anyone who meets him. The Overboss's endgame weapon choice is the handmade rifle. You don't have to make it yourself though, but you will be modifying it to be fully automatic. The gun fires with a satisfying crunch, dishing out huge amounts of damage and even offers the option of customization with any of the Nuka World faction paints. With all perks, this gun will do 94 damage at a fire rate of 113. We recommend purchasing the legendary variant called the Splatter Cannon from Aaron Corbett in the Nuka Town market. This variant increases damage with each consecutive hit on the same target. The other boss's companion will be the brand new Nuka World DLC character, Gage. Gage is a raider through and through, and acts as the right hand man to the player in the DLC. Reaching maximum affinity with Gage grants access to the Lessons in Blood perk, which gives you plus 10 to damage resistance, which is alright, but luckily gives you plus 5% experience per kill. Until you get Gage, use Strong as your companion. The Nuka World DLC introduces a new approach to settlement building. As the leader of a faction of raiders, you'll be able to overthrow existing settlements with your gang. This is explained more throughout the questline, but the overboss has all the skills needed to run settlements. As you conquer the commonwealth one settlement at a time, you can open chem, outfit, and weapon dealers to reinforce the strength of the overboss. And there you have it guys, the first Fudge Muppet Fallout 4 build for the Nuka World DLC. We hope you enjoy roleplaying the Raider Overboss and exploring everything the Nuka World Amusement Park has to offer. If you love the build, hitting that like button would be hugely appreciated. Be sure to subscribe if you're new around here as well, and as usual, links to the video sections and our social media profiles are in the description. Thanks for watching everyone, I'm Michael and I'll see you next time.